Grace and peace to you from the one who is, and who was, and who is to come. In my house, it's probably been at least five years since I've experienced a meal where we sat around the table in silence. However, I know from eating around other tables that such a thing does actually occur. Should you find yourself in that situation and you are not enjoying the silence, you can turn to the very helpful webpage, 50 Family Dinner Conversation Starters. For an entry-level conversation starter, you could ask, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? To create a conversation with a more reflective twist, you could ask, what is one thing you're grateful for today? And if you're willing to entertain the possibility of perhaps opening up a big old can of worms, you can throw this one out there. If you could trade places with your parents for a day, what would you do differently? You let me know how that one turns out for you. <laughs> All through his ministry, even up to the Last Supper, and now over breakfast on the beach after the resurrection, Jesus was always one to carry on a conversation around a meal. The disciples had returned to Galilee and decided to head out to fish, going back to the profession that many of them had before Jesus called them to follow him. Jesus calls out from the shore, You don't have anything to eat, do you? After working all night with nothing to show for it, this probably wasn't the best conversation starter. But Jesus then blesses them with that catch of 153 large fish. Jesus, oddly enough, already has some fish cooking over a charcoal fire on the beach. So he invites the disciples to come join him for breakfast. The disciples didn't recognize him before, but having spent so much time in conversation with Jesus around so many tables, now they don't dare ask if it's him. Once he begins feeding them, there can be no doubt that they are sitting with the risen Christ. If you're at the table with Jesus, you can count on an interesting conversation starter. Jesus turns to one disciple in particular, one who had denied Jesus three times around another charcoal fire, and says to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? There's no way of knowing what Jesus is asking Simon to measure his love against. He could be asking Jesus if he loves him more than his fishing tools. Will he trade being an apostle for being a fisherman? He could be asking if he loves Jesus more than he loves the other disciples. Will he let his love for Jesus guide his decisions rather than his love of his other disciples? He could be asking Simon if he loves Jesus more than the other disciples love Jesus. Will he lead by example and have greater love for Jesus than the other disciples? Even though Peter is just as often an example of what not to do, when Jesus drops this conversation starter on him at breakfast, Peter very wisely refuses to make it a conversation about comparisons. He turns instead to his own love for Jesus. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus says to him, feed my lambs. Jesus throws the exact same conversation starter at Peter two more times. The second time, Simon gives Jesus the same response, and Jesus tells him, shepherd my sheep. The third time, Jesus asks, Simon responds, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus tells him again, Feed my sheep. This conversation starter creates a conversation about Peter's love for Jesus. Each time he responded, Peter affirmed that he loved Jesus. This affirmation opens the door to a larger and longer conversation about what it meant for Peter to love Jesus. This mealtime conversation began with Jesus reaching out and continued with a faithful response to Jesus. This faithful response leads to Jesus offering another conversation start, one that opens up that much larger conversation about what it meant to live as a disciple. While none of us have ever sat down for a breakfast of charred grilled fish on the beach with Jesus, the risen Christ does come to eat with us week in and week out. Every time we gather around the table, Jesus reaches out to us with a conversation start. This is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you. This conversation starter creates a conversation 
about what Jesus has done for us. With these words he said at the altar and said to each and every person who joins him at the table, Jesus is reaching out with the promise of forgiveness and resurrection life that's given as a free gift on the cross. When we respond to Jesus' conversation starter, whether we say amen or thanks be to God or say to the person serving and also for you, we're affirming our trust in that promise Jesus has made. Jesus then works through that trust and the Holy Spirit works through that faith to offer another conversation starter. One opening the door to a much larger and longer conversation about what it means for us to live as devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. Living as people who trust Jesus' promises, as people who are in conversation with Christ about how to live faithfully, we look for conversation starters that continue the resurrection conversation Jesus began on the cross and in the empty tomb. Now one of the ways that Jesus continued that resurrection conversation was by blessing the disciples with an eye-catching haul of fish. Whatever else might be significant about that number of 153, it's certainly a sign of the abundance that's going to burst forth from all creation once the resurrection is fully worked out in the world. But if we only let what's miraculous or spectacular serve as conversation starters about the resurrection, we will miss out on most of the conversations we are called to have as people who continue that resurrection conversation with the world. As devoted disciples of Jesus Christ, our conversation starters should be different than they are for most people. This challenge is one of the reasons the Holy Spirit gathers us together into community. As that community gathered around Christ, seeing someone go hungry is a conversation starter about how we can feed this is a conversation that includes serving at the Northwest Indiana Food Bank, being a part of the Shepherd's Suppers every month, and giving time to pack away hunger this fall. Finding out about a family where the father is fighting health problems that both keep him from working and make the medical bills pile up is a conversation starter about how we can show mercy through our mission of the month. Learning that isolation is toxic for people, particularly for older people, is a conversation starter about how we can let people know they are not alone. This is a conversation that includes our congregational care team reaching out to those who can't make it to church and volunteers packing shoeboxes for seniors as a tangible sign to people that they have not been forgotten. These are just a few examples of the types of conversation starters that we are called to see and to respond to because Jesus has already started a conversation with us. So while we might take a seat at some tables and sit in silence, Jesus has invited all of us to his table, where he always has a conversation to start. It may come as a question to answer, a promise to trust, or even a need to meet with mercy, but Jesus will always reach out to us in love with a conversation to start. We're free to answer in any way we want, but when we respond with faith and trust, it becomes the beginning of a much larger and longer conversation about how to live faithfully. As this conversation reshapes our lives, God works through us to continue the resurrection conversation that God began with the world on Easter. As we see resurrection coming into the world, it returns us to that conversation starter of the cross and the empty tomb, a conversation where God promises us new life now and resurrection life to come. Thanks be to God.